Let's continue with another decision rule for supervised classification is called maximum likelihood. So it is the most commonly used uh, decision rule for supervised classification. It is based on the probability that a pixel belongs to a particular class rather than spectral distance in feature space. Okay, so the pixel at X or simply call it um, pixel X belongs to a particular class W when the likelihood that the correct class is W is the largest. Okay, and this method is based on the assumption that spectral values for all classes or for each individual class follow normal distribution. What is a normal distribution? It can be used to address uh, a lot of phenomena in real world. When we're talking about, uh, when we're saying that something, uh, some phenomenon is following normal distribution, it means that uh, most observations from that phenomenon or the majority of uh, the observations from a phenomenon, um, they are not too big, neither too small, okay? Which means uh, in terms of this observations values, um, these values are not too small, neither too, nor too high or too big. So that's normal distribution, okay? Majority is in the center. Uh, and there are outliers. These outliers, uh, they either have very big values or very small values, but these outliers, they are minority. So this is normal distribution, right? And the characteristics of maximum likelihood method is that uh, are, are that, um, uh, uh, firstly, okay, it is the most widely used classifier or decision rule for supervised classification. So, which means that um, you can f you can find it in in all remote sensing um, software. Okay, and the box or minimum distance decision rule uh, may generate better results when the histograms of the bands of data do not have normal distributions. It means that um, the accuracy of this method of maximum likelihood method is, uh, is built on this assumption, okay? But if that assumption is not very suitable for your specific data sets, then this method should not be used because its accuracy will be affected. So before using maximum likelihood, likelihood method, you should check the histogram uh, or histograms of bands you are going to use, okay? To make sure that the histogram for each band you are going to use is uh, in general following normal distribution. You would ask, how do I confirm that? Let me give you examples of histograms following normal distribution. Here we have two histograms, right? Um, they are actually the same histogram, but uh, you can see that uh, majority is in the center, is at the center of this histogram. And if we consider the frequency here is frequency for pixels, then you can say within this image, most pixels, they have not very big nor very small values. If the, uh, if the range, uh, I mean, the range for values is from one to 255, uh, most values, they are in the center. They're in the center. Obviously, uh, for this specific histogram, it's not a linear one, okay? It's from one to nine, then here we should have a very long distance, but for illustration, right? So on the right side, we have 255. But in general, this is the histogram you want to find when you decide to use, uh, before, before you chose, you're choosing maximum likelihood as your classifier, okay? All bands you're going to use in this classifier, uh, they should in general follow this shape. 
okay, normal distribution. And on the right side, we have the mathematical expression of uh, normal distribution. Let me tell you the, uh, uh, the meaning of this uh, density function. So on the left side of, uh, of the equation, we have PXWI. It means that we're, we're going to find out uh, the probability of X belonging to class WI. Okay, class WI. So on the right side, we can see that this is a specific function about X. X is the independent variable. Uh, other parameters, uh, we have mu I. This is the mean value of W I. And uh, we also have this uh, standard deviation I. So this is the standard deviation of class I. Once you have the training sites, you have training sites for WI um, using those pixels, okay? Using those training sites, you can calculate mu I and uh, uh, mean value and standard deviation of WI on each band. And you can use them. You can use them to finish this equation. And when you gave a specific X value, eventually you will have a probability you will, you will use the right side of this equation to calculate the probability that this x, this pixel x, belonging to class wi. Okay, so um, you may you may need to uh, repeat this um, repeat this calculation several times for each class for each possible class. Uh, in your image and find out and find out the maximum p value for x and uh, usually we assign that pixel x to that class with the highest with the maximum p value okay okay uh, this is a 3d version of normal distribution um, it is very it is actually very similar to this one. This is a two-dimensional two-dimensional uh, normal distribution. But here, okay, we have two bands, right band and near-infrared band. And of course, the third dimension is still for frequency, but here it is actually for probability density function value. So p-value instead of um, instead of frequency here, here is probability density function value, or you can say the value for PDF, okay? So you can say, um, according to this specific illustration here, we have forest, we have cotton, we have corn, we have bare soil, we have water, we have white land. According to uh, this mm, 3D visualizations, for all these classes, we can tell that all these classes, uh, uh, they are following normal distribution, right? Because uh, for each class, there is a very obvious peak, okay? That's the, that's, the, uh, the, that's the majority of that class. Although for water, that peak is not very obvious, but still you can say here, is, here for water, we still have a bell-shaped uh, distribution. Okay, so if um, if you you're trying to decide if I I want to use maximum likelihood for this specific image, and you just found out uh, you just uh, collected a training size for all classes within this image, and you use a three D visualization uh, to address all those classes uh, training size, and the result is this figure, then I can tell you that you should use maximum likelihood. Um, to do the classification for this specific image. Because according to this illustration, all classes here, one, two, three, four, five, six, the six classes, you can tell that at least for red band and near infrared band, these six classes, they're all following normal distribution. And that is the assumption you should confirm, you should confirm before uh, using maximum likelihood. And here, uh, it's very safe to say that um, you can use maximum likelihood method based on this uh, visualization, 
Okay. And here is the specific. Here is a specific example for uh, for maximum likelihood classification. Okay. So here we have pixel X, unknown measurement vector X associated with a single pixel in a two-band multispectral data set. We have band one. We have band two. So what we want to do here? Okay. We need to decide which class which class x belongs to if and only if pxwi larger or equals is larger or equals a pxwj okay it means that uh, we need to find out the the, the maximum p value for x Okay, and of course you have p value for each class. For each class, you have a specific p, p value for x for each class. You want to find out the, the max p value among them. And uh, the class associated with that max p value should be the class of pixel x. Here you can say x is right here. Right, so band one, band two, and uh, we have uh, uh, several. Uh, we actually have two ellipses here. The ellipse, the ellipse on the left side is for forest training data. Another ellipse on the right side uh, is for for what agriculture training data. Right, so X is right here. X is right, is right here. Let's just assume that uh, these two classes, forest and agriculture, they are both following normal distribution. And according to these two ellipses, we can draw the, um, the general PDF curve or probability density curve for these two classes. This green curve is for forest. And uh, this, um, say orange, this orange curve, a uh, dashed curve is for agriculture. So X is right here. If you project X to uh, this space for PDFs, for probability density functions, you can say uh, the intersection between X and the green curve is here. The intersection between X and the orange curve is here, which means that the probability of X belonging to forest is higher than the probability of X belonging to agriculture. So according, according to maximum likelihood method, which class should we assign pixel X to? Forest or agriculture? Obviously, according to this specific scenario, it should be forest instead of agriculture okay so this mathematical expression here is trying to uh, tell you this this is a principle for maximum likelihood you always want to find out the max value of p okay and p is based on x and for, for X, there are multiple p-values because there are multiple classes, right? So here, we only have two classes, which p-value is larger. Obviously, px forest is, is right here, right? Is larger than px agriculture. So according to this specific um, scenario, we would say that um, we will just assign X to forest. Okay, or we simply call X is a forest uh, a pixel. Okay, okay. And uh, next, next, I want to talk about unsupervised classification. So uh, I'm not sure if you still remember the difference between supervised and unsupervised classification. Uh, the, the, the major difference is that unsupervised classification does not require training sites. Merely grouping, grouping pixels based on spectral similarity. So there are two steps. So first, pixels with similar spectral reflective uh, characteristics, they are grouped into distinct clusters. 
Okay, and second step, these spectral clusters are then labeled with a certain class name. That's it. But in, in the actual algorithm, we need to repeat step one and step two for many times. So some thresholds can be achieved or specific number of iterations um, has been achieved, has been, has, been, has been done, okay? Usually we say we should do IM times uh, iteration. And before that, we do not stop. And after IM times of iteration, for step one and step two, um, we will label uh, 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 names on different classes, okay? So two steps, but there will be iterations, which means that we do these two steps again and again and again repeatedly. The most famous unsupervised classification method is called ISO data, iterative self-organizing data analysis, okay? How to do that? Let me tell you. Okay, so here, for example, um, we have we have the data. We have pixels addressed uh, within this um, feature space, and this feature space is formed by band three and band four. Uh, let's just ignore a specific sensor. Um, it's the same. Let's just say we have two bands. For band three, we have a we have a mean value mu, and here is a minus one standard deviation plus one standard deviation. For band four, similarly, we also have a mu and a, a plus one standard deviation and minus one uh, standard deviation. So the first step: initial distribution of five hypothetical mean vectors using positive, negative, one standard deviations uh, in both bands as beginning and ending points. What does it mean? It means that firstly, we have statistics of these two bands, right? Means and uh, minus one standard deviations and the mean plus one standard deviations. We use them to start the iteration. Firstly, we use two means to find out this first red pixel here. And we use a mean plus one standard deviation for band four and the mean plus one standard deviation for band three to find the second pixel. And similarly, we use mean minus one standard deviation on band four and the mean minus one standard deviation on band three to find this third pixel here, red pixel. Now we have the central pixel, the second pixel, and the third pixel. These three pixels can form this rectangle, right? And along this diagonal of this rectangle, we can find out two other pixels. They are on the, uh, they, they you should say for example, for, let me use this pen a little bit. So let me connect ink color green. Let's connect these two pixels. Let's just assume this green line here is a straight line, okay? This straight line is connecting the central pixel and this pixel uh, on one end of this rectangle. And how to decide the position of this uh, fourth pixel, fourth red pixel? It is what? in the middle, or you can say it halves this straight line between these two pixels, okay? So that's the fourth pixel. And similarly, we can find out the fifth pixel, okay? It is still on the midpoint, okay? It is in the middle of these two red pixels. Okay, now we have five pixels five red pixels and they can be used to create five clusters like this okay okay what happened what happened from here to uh that five clusters so 
five pixels have been decided. They're right here. Okay, next step. We measure the distance between each pixels and uh, these five pixels. And uh, we assign, we consider that uh, each pixel belongs to a specific cluster. One, its distance to that cluster center, which should be a red pixel here, is the shortest among five distances between that pixel and five red pixel here. For example, here is uh, here is five clusters here, right? Let me find out. Um, Oops, where is, uh, okay, it's right here. So for example, here we have a green pixel. It's right here. So which cluster does this pixel belong to? We measure the distance between this green pixel and all five red pixels. And obviously the shortest distance is between itself and this red pixel. Then it belongs to cluster four. And we do this for all pixels within this image. And we have these five initial clusters. And you should know that ellipses here in this figure, they are only for illustration. Okay, they're only for illustration. So, and uh, with, uh, we, 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 we drew this ellipse based on what? A standard deviation of, of, of clusters. So here we have five initial clusters, okay, five initial clusters. So now we have four, five initial clusters and we need to recalculate centers for them. Be careful, be careful. Now these five red pixels, they are not centers of these five clusters, okay? A lot of people may think they are centers of these five clusters, they are not because these four, five clusters, they are based on distance between each pixel and uh, all five red pixels. It doesn't mean that these five pixels, they are centers of these five initial clusters, okay? That's very important. So we have five initial clusters here and we don't need these five initial red pixels anymore. We use five new clusters to find out five real centers for these five clusters. And these five pixels right now, they are true centers for these five new classes. And during this process, there could be merging or splitting of clusters, okay? Uh, which means that uh, sometimes we need to merge two or even more classes um, to, 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 to create a new class, or some class is just too big. We need to split it to create two or even more classes to make our classification more accurate. I will uh, give you some principles um, uh, for, for merging and splitting of clusters later, but you should know this is happening when you have four or uh, five initial clusters. Okay, for this specific uh, scenario, but um, uh, uh, merging and splitting, they are happening um, uh, a lot in iterations of ISO data. So then uh, every pixel in the thing uh, is assigned to one of the new clusters, okay? Uh, some of these new clusters, they're simply, uh, uh, maybe, maybe this, some of these five initial clusters they will stay the same, they will stay the same. And some of them will be merged, some of them will be split, will be split, okay? And uh, some merging rules here, okay? Merge clusters, one should we merge them? Principles here, for example, minimum members in a cluster. If a cluster contains less than the minimum percentage of members, Okay, for example, a percentage of uh, all pixels within the image. It is deleted and the members are assigned to an alternative 
cluster, which means that if a cluster is just too small, okay, for example, the default minimum percentage of members is often set to 0 0.01. It means that if a cluster contains less than 1% of total pixels in this image, we consider this cluster too small. We will just delete it. And uh, all pixels within this cluster will be assigned to other existing clusters. And how to assign them? Uh, the easiest way is based on spectral distance. Okay, and uh, still uh, there could be other methods, but the main principle here is minimum members in cluster. And another principle you may use is minimum distance between cluster means. Clusters with a weighted distance less than this value threshold, okay, are merged. Usually a default of 3.0 of distance spectral distance, okay, because it's within this uh, uh, feature space, is often used. What does it mean? It means that if two clusters, they're too close to each other, uh, we usually consider them as the same class because their centers are just too close to, uh, too close to each other. And uh, if, the, uh, if the actual spectral distance between two means, okay, uh, uh, two means from two clusters is just too small. This distance is too small. Then we may consider just merging these two clusters to create a new cl cluster. Okay. So here we have two uh, 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 two principles for merging clusters. Okay. And another principle I want to introduce here is for uh, the splitting of clusters. It's, called, it's a commonly used one. It's called maximum standard deviation. When the standard deviation for a specific cluster exceeds the specific, uh, the, the specified maximum standard deviation, and the number of members in the class is greater than twice the specified minimum members in a class, the class is split into two clusters. It means that if a cluster is just too big, okay? It's just too big. Maybe in order to get more accurate outputs for uh, this classification, we need to split this huge cluster into two small clusters. And uh, how, to, how to judge if this cluster is too big? We use standard deviation. If you have ever enrolled a statistics class, you should know that standard deviation is usually used to address the extent of spreading of your data set. If the standard deviation of a data set is pretty big, it means that, okay, uh, the observations in this data set is spreading out. There are very big values, there are very small values. Of course, there are uh, values not very big or not very, uh, uh, small. On the other hand, if the standard deviation of a data set is very small, it means that uh, all observations in your data set, they have very similar values. There are no, there is no extremely high values. There is no extremely low values. All observations, they are very close to the mean of your data set. That's the scenario for very low standard deviation. Okay, so here we use maximum standard deviation to as the threshold to judge if a cluster is just huge enough. Of course, you can set a specific number, a specific value for, for, for your specific classification um, as maximum standard deviation. Okay, uh, during SO data, if uh, the software um, uh, during the during the iteration, during the classification, if this stand, uh, standard deviation has has been touched, okay, by a specific uh, cluster, uh, the software will consider this cluster uh, a too big one, and it should be split. Okay, okay, and the split merge assign. 
uh, or labeling uh, process continuous until there is little change in class assignment between iterations. Okay, uh, some of or one of the thresholds I mentioned before. Okay, for example, uh, minimum members in a cluster, minimum distance between cluster means, or maximum standard deviation. These thresholds, okay, uh, even they're still there, but after, uh, I mean, between iterations, there is very limited change based on the thresholds. Um, then we should stop um, the classification. It means that uh, the current uh, clusters, they are very stable in terms of the thresholds, okay? Then you should stop. Or uh, uh, as a user, you can arbitrarily assign a specific value M as the number of iterations you want as a data to finish. This is called, this M is called arbitrary because it has nothing to do with the thresholds. I mean, during the, the during the ISO data, um, you can you can still assign the thresholds, and uh, the software will follow the thresholds to merge or split what clusters. But that is not the highest priority. This M here is a priority. If you set M, for example, to ten, after ten times of iteration, the software will stop no matter the threshold has been matched or not, no matter, the, uh, uh, no matter there is a, a, a huge or little change between iterations, because 10 iterations have been done and M equals 10, that's user specified and ISO data will stop. Okay, okay. So uh, ISO data, like I said, it's a, uh, it's a, classification method based on iterations. And during iterations, uh, during ISO data classification, uh, the software will use um, uh, thresholds to decide if a cluster should be uh, split or multiple clusters should be merged. But uh, when we're talking about uh, one to end ISO data, you can, of course, using uh, the thresholds, okay, um, using them uh, to, 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 to merge, to split clusters. And uh, uh, if uh, after several iterations, there is a limited change, very small change between iterations, between last several iterations uh, based on the thresholds, then, okay, um, you can just let the software stop. We consider these clusters, they are mature, uh, they are stable, okay? Or um, you can arbitrarily uh, give or assign a specific M value um, as the maximum number of iteration when that value um, has been reached, okay? That number M, M of um, M iterations have been done, uh, the software should stop. Of course, you can do that. Okay, so that's unsupervised classification. And I will just stop here for this video and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.